This episode of Indie Mogul is brought to you by Magnanimous Rentals. Today we've got $9,000. Body today is a little over $100,000, $125,000. I know, some of you guys are freaking out. You guys are like, I'm trying to buy a house. I'm trying to <laughs> pay for my kids' braces. How am I gonna pay for all this? Why do I need this kind of bigger setup? Well, if you want to start working the studio mode setup, yeah. I actually think that this camera system right over cool. here is probably a really good place to start. Hey, what's going on, Indie Mogul? Today I'm here with my friend Ilya Friedman, who's basically one of the most technical guys that I know out there. Super, super knowledgeable about camera equipment and the accessories. Ilya, tell me a little bit about that experience. I've worked in about every capacity you can with a camera. I started off as a cameraman, camera assistant, camera operator, uh, way back in 1993. All different types of movies, uh, features, commercials, television, music videos. And now I run Hot Rod Cameras, where we uh, still develop and build some of our own stuff, but mostly we're a retailer. We sell equipment to Hollywood, government, uh, owner operators, cinematographers, all kinds of people Everybody. like that. Everybody. Yeah. Elia is literally a wizard when it comes to this stuff, so you guys are lucky to have him here today. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about specifically what it actually takes to build a studio camera setup. So. Ilya, first of all, what does it actually mean to have this camera in studio mode? Studio mode means that it's not run and gun, it means that you're not by yourself. It means that you've got a crew with you and that you are going to be able to uh, repeat your setups over and over again to do multiple takes with talent, with cast. Yeah. So that means uh, you've got marks from A to B. If you're not working in studio mode, it can be very difficult to try to do take six or seven and have them all line up the same and have them be the same way that you would have done it had you have been in studio mode. Yeah, he's talking about a place where you actually kind of meticulously plan out your shots, where you actually have a crew. We're talking about a place that ideally a lot of you guys are working towards being into if you're coming on that super, super indie level. So, studio mode again, repeatability. Is a repeatability big is a big deal. Okay, so my question is, uh, this right here is a GH5S on a Ronin S. I think this right here is probably a setup that I think a lot of content creators out there, you know, this is the setup that they generally recommend for each other as a budget mm -hmm. creation tool. So what are your thoughts on this kind of thing, first of all? Well, I think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful tool. No one should be confusing this setup with this setup. They're, they're, they're for different applications. This allows you to do a lot of different things very quickly. Yeah. May not necessarily allow you to do everything though the way that you would be doing in a, in a studio shoot. This is very, very affordable. This is for someone who does not have a crew. Yeah. This is someone who has to try to focus themselves, rely on autofocus, try to re redo the operation over and over again, smooth out as many uh, shakes as that might be created here. All of that stuff here is, is completely different. They're not exactly apples to apples. They're yeah. not even apples to oranges. It's more like apples to cantaloupes. Absolutely. So, so that is kind of what I want to talk about today too, is that I think there's a lot of comments out there and I see people saying they think that a gimbal replaces any movement that you need to get. And they think, hey, you know, I don't understand. The, the, the GH5S already shoots 4K. What the heck? It's already shooting, in a lot of cases, you know, better resolution than some older cinema cameras on the market. Sure. So the question out there is, why do I need this kind of bigger setup, this literally if we include the, the dolly in this, which we can't buy, over a million dollar setup for this kind of thing? What is the baseline if we want to start working in a studio mode. Well, if you want to start working in a studio mode setup, yeah. I actually think that this camera system right over cool. here is probably a really good place to start. This is a Fuji X-T3. And the Fuji X-T3 is an incredible little camera. And Fuji also makes essentially like a miniature version of this really fancy lens over there. And they call it the MKX lens. There's a wide and a long. This is the wide version. This is the 18 to 55. But it's kind of like they shrunk down that lens and they gave it a native Fuji mount so you can put it on top of this or attach to this like $1,300 camera that is frankly incredible. It makes yeah. really good images and it has wonderful resolution. It has tremendous dynamic range, but it's a consumer camera. It's a prosumer camera. It's designed to work in a completely different way than something like this. It's designed for the one man band to try to get as much oomph that you can possibly get out of yeah. one small piece of tech versus uh, this, which is designed to have a whole crew to be able to do the shots that are repeatable over and over again. But we've added a few things. We added a, a Tilta Nucleus M wireless focus system on here. This is maybe a $1,500 product. Everything is a, is a bit of a compromise, but when you're compromising down to this, you're also saving tons and tons of money. This is a incredibly affordable lens. And when you, you put all this together here, you're probably in maybe seven or $8,000. But for the indie studio person, we're on top of a, a tripod dolly. It's only a couple of thousand dollars and it can roll around can't boom up and down. It's not exactly the same thing as this, this setup. But for someone who's trying to just start out or create some sort of indie fare, you can do a lot with something like this. You can do something because you have a higher threshold for pain. If there's a problem, then you know maybe you're only spending like $150 an hour or $700 an hour, not $100,000 an hour while production is, is waiting. Now, as far as the camera cage goes for this, uh, what are we looking at here? 
Uh, you're looking at a cage from a company called Aitsen. Uh, Aitsen makes some very, very clever, very ergonomic little cages. It allows access to all the points you might need to access, including the hot shoe on top, plus all the dials, um, and the ability to change the battery while it's all rigged up. Uh, how much does this generally run? It's a couple hundred dollars. It's not, cool. not very much. Cool, super affordable. Last two things real quick. One, we got the battery here on the back. What's this right here? Yeah, it's an IDX battery. It's a VMAP battery. It's one of the two professional standards. Yep. I think this one's about $200. And then finally, last up here is the monitor. So yeah. if you can't have a big monitor with you on set. Uh, a little monitor can actually do a lot for you. This is an Atomos Ninja V, and yeah. the uh, it's, a, it's a great little monitor. It lets you start working with the right tools. And again, it's a lot different than, again, eagity biggity. This little baby setup that uh, I think we know and uh, see quite often online. So, okay, so okay. what do we got behind here? Uh, behind us is an Alexa Classic. This is similar body style to what is probably the current most popular studio camera system out there, which would be the Alexa LF. This is a Fujinon 28 to 100 Permista, and it's a constant T29, something really important for studio style. What is the difference between a lens that ramps and a lens like this that's actually calibrated for studio mode? So uh, a constant aperture lens like this means if you set it to 29 or mm -hmm. set it to four, anywhere along your focal range on this lens, 20 to 100 is going to be the exact same amount of light passing through. When you're talking about uh, more consumer style lenses, the, quite often, depending on where you're in the zoom range, a different amount of light is going to be passing through, and so that's why you might notice that when you're all the way wide, everything looks bright, but then when you zoom in, it looks dark. A proper studio zoom like this is going to have a calibrated aperture all the way through every focal length. Yeah. It's going to have accurate focus marks, so 10 feet on here equals 10 feet on a consumer lens. 10 feet doesn't mean anything. 6 feet doesn't mean anything. Those are just suggestions. But you can measure this yourself if you have a consumer lens at home yeah. by taking a tape measure putting it at about where you think the sensor is and moving it out into distance 10 feet and then setting 10 feet on your lens and see if it actually is in focus. And the answer is it's not. Your focus puller needs to be able to adjust. And on this lens is the C-Motion C-Pro follow focus system. That gives you FIS access, which stands for focus, iris, and zoom. And so you can see I've got focus and zoom hooked up right here. One assistant could control all three of these axes here if you wanted to. Most of the time, the person that's operating this doesn't have enough hands and not enough focus and concentration to be able to maintain everything that's happening on the lens and the camera at the same time. Correct. So. And sometimes there's not room for the assistant to stand here either, and so they have to be standing somewhere further away in order to control this. Now, before we move on, I want to remind everybody about our wonderful sponsor, and that is Magnanimous Rentals, who were there for us in the previous video where we actually did a camera kit and how to rent it out for actually less than $1,000. And they are here for us again, because if you can't afford the Aria Alexa Studio Pill that we are featuring in today's episode, which nobody in their right minds can, you can actually go rent out all of this nice gear. We're talking about Alexas, we're talking about Reds, Leicas, Cooks, anything for any kind of production, big or small. They recently just got the new Teradek Ace 500 for all of your wireless monitoring needs. This month actually marks their 10th year anniversary. So starting in the month of January, you can actually enjoy a 10% off site-wide discount for anything that you rent out. And even though they are a rental house based in Chicago, they can actually ship your rental order anywhere in the US. If you want to learn more about who they are and how they can actually ship that rental order to you for free, head on over to bagdanimousrentals.com start inquiring about the next ideal camera kit for your next production. But now, Back to the episode. Moving on from the actual lens, what other features do we have on the top here? We've got a uh, map box here from Bright Tangerine. It's called the Strummer. So this by itself, we're just talking about the camera, the lens, and the actual map box. Uh, what are we looking at in terms of price points for these three? Today, about $9,000. When it was new, probably would have been more like $90,000. The yeah. equivalent LF body today is a little over 100,000, 125,000, somewhere yeah. in that range. As far as the lens goes, what are we talking about here? Roughly $40,000. I think it's about 38, 39 right now. So I know some of you guys are freaking out. You guys are like, uh, $140,000. Uh, I'm trying to buy a house. How am I going to pay for all this? We're just breaking <laughs> down what the kind of industry standard looks like for the high-end productions here. So uh, finally with the matte box here, this is a little bit more affordable, but right now this uh, matte box is only about 3,500 and yep. you're going like $3,500 for a matte box, but really that's a, that's a very good deal. Big old monitor here. What are we looking at here? And what's the reason why we need a high quality monitor like this? And the size as well too. You want to be able to see details. You want to yeah. be able to see what's going on. You want to have an, a good understanding and accurate color representation. So a monitor that you can load LUTs into, a monitor that is calibratable, all those things are really important. So again, at the end of the day, it comes down to functionality. It comes down to 
being able to calibrate the color, making sure that it is accurate color when you're looking at it. And then finally, the size too. Uh, I know it sounds silly, but having a bigger screen, you know, you leave a roll of gaff tape in the back corner there. It's a lot easier to see when you have a bigger monitor to be able to spot these kinds of things. Always. Now, as far as this actual handle goes, what kinds of things are we gonna be rigging onto here? Most commonly, you might see something like a wireless video transmitter. You might see an onboard light. You might see onboard monitors. No, so it's really just options here at the end of the day. Correct. Whatever you need at the time of day could be plugged into here. Well. Exactly right. So then on top of this, we've got our actual movement system here. This seems yeah, yeah. like a lot, but this is really kind of one piece. What you're looking at here is the Fisher 10 Dolly. It's one of the industry standards for camera movement, especially for studio mode. It has an incredible hydraulic system, which allows you to move this, to boom the camera up and down. It also has the ability to adjust the wheels into different modes, and you can roll really, really smoothly around the set. When you're shooting in a studio and you have a nice smooth floor surface like this, you can change your setups really quickly. You can change your focal length with the zoom lens. You can roll the dolly wherever you need to be next, and that's how you get those perfectly smooth shots over and over and over again when you're you're working with a crew. It's not the most expensive, but this is a pretty damn good Rolls Royce as far as... You can't buy this. It's rental only. So okay, I don't, so, so you literally you, could not you, buy this. You literally can't buy this. That's not expensive and scary for you enough as it is. There you go. At least you know what these things are and you understand kind of the function of what each purpose serves here. Now, why is it worth it to spend more money on more expensive gear? Oh my God. Uh, no, it's a big question. It's a big question. If you're talking about doing stuff where you have a crew and you have a large cast and you might have hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, disappearing every, every hour, you need to be able to have gear that is 100% reliable, repeats every single time, and all the parts fit together. Anything fidgety, anything that doesn't fit perfectly and work the way it's supposed to, you don't have time for. You don't really have time to troubleshoot. Troubleshooting is the worst. You never want to have the eyes of the entire set looking at you. Why aren't we shooting right now? Because this person has this problem. When you're working with consumer level gear or when you're working with prosumer level gear, you got to have a little bit more of a threshold for pain. How much you're willing to put up with in order to work with. And anyone who's tried to put together like a small gimbal system and a DSLR and then can't do what it is they need to do immediately has experienced this pain. People who are trained to work with this equipment know that it's going to work exactly the way it should every time and when it doesn't, they know how to immediately swap it out for the right thing rather than trying to troubleshoot it on set. So uh, real quick, Ilya, how much is the price point of this entire setup here? What are we looking at approximately? Under $10,000. Under $10,000. And I know that sounds expensive to a lot of you guys, but for a lot of people that want to start working at a professional level, actually stop fighting their tools, especially in terms of you know, being able to have controllability, repeatability here. Uh, this really is kind of a baseline entry point for people that want to do more serious work out there. So for you people out there with your GH5s and your own messes, what do you have to say to that? I think, it, I think it's wonderful. It's a terrific place to start. And if you want to move into more narrative production, maybe something like this is, uh, is in your future. So again, uh, now you at least you hopefully can look at this and understand piece by piece a little bit of what it does. Maybe you don't own one. Actually, well, you might. In like 10 years, it might it, be really cheap. Yeah, actually, as things yeah. move on, you might be able to afford some of these. I mean, this camera itself is already now about the same price as all of that. Elliot, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, uh, my pleasure. For people that want to find you as well, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me in two places. Number one, Hot Rod Camera is where we're standing right now. Right this is where I am Monday through Friday. You can also find me over at the Cinematography Podcast, where we talk about all things related to the moving image and have some great uh, guests on the show. Yeah, and if people have questions about all this gear, can they bug you online and of ask course. questions? Where can they find you? Over at Hot Rod Cameras and mm -hmm. all different forms of social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram and the like. Uh, but uh, the best way is to call us. Pick up the phone, call us. If you can't talk to me, talk to any of the people here. Everyone here is very technically competent and can help. Again, a big thank you to Magnanimous Rentals. Don't forget about them. They are here for all of your rental needs. And you can go to magnanimousrentals.com to check them out. And in case you didn't know, we've also got a podcast discussion with the one and only Ilya Friedman that we're going to put in the description down below. So make sure you check that out as well. But other than that, Indy Mogul, thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, we'll catch you guys next time. Scott, well, okay, the, so, so the official Matt Scott, uh, Matt Scott of Hot Red Cameras. the official Matt Scott. Uh, he makes noise and moves his feet. He makes noise? Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what a time it. Close yeah. your book. Now you broke camera. Okay, there All you right. go. Now he's fine. All right, cool. Let's get out of here. <laughs>